Financial Report. I'm Max Kaiser. Time now to go to Mitch Fire Stein, author of Planet Ponzi, which I'm holding here right now. This is the book that explains, this is the, the Rosetta Stone of the entire global scam. Mitch, welcome back to the Kaiser Report. Thanks for having me here. All right, Mitch Feierstein, you have some props, some lovely props. I like what I see. Tell me, what, what is all of this? Well, Max, I think that what we need to do is explain to everyone the scope, scale, and magnitude of what a trillion dollars or three trillion dollars actually means. This is a U.S. $100 bill, $100 bill. This is my briefcase. If you take this briefcase, a million dollars is a lot of money to me. You can fill it up with $100 bills and it would be a million dollars. Okay, I okay. got it. So, so this is the, roughly the size of a hundred, a million dollars and hundred dollar bills. Correct. Now, the Fed's balance sheet, which is over three trillion dollars, that would be in hundred dollar bills if you were to stack them up. It would be 10,000 times taller than, or actually 11,000 times taller than the Empire State Building. Mm -hmm. That's pretty high. 3.7 million meters tall. Okay. So it's vast. 1.4 trillion is the entire amount of mon the monetary gold in the world. Now, now before this, the crisis started, they had roughly 800 billion on their balance sheet. Now it's over three trillion. That's right. And, and during the crisis, as part of the dealing with the crisis, they swap toxic assets with the banking community for fresh treasury bills, and they keep those toxic assets on their books, with the idea that at some point um, you're going to fake it till you make it. At some point, growth will happen, and then they can unwind that balance sheet. But growth's not happening. The, the problem is there's a blame game going on. The favorite game is. Three, three different elements of it, divert and deflect, de delay and pray, and extend and pretend. That's the bag of tricks that they have. Unfortunately, you reach a brick wall at some point, and the effectiveness of QE starts diminishing each time you do it. Right, because going back to, you know, even go back 20, 30 years, there were, the idea was you can float debt, the debt creates growth, and the growth, as long as the GDP is rising faster than the rate or percentage that your debt is growing, you net net, you have a growing economy. But starting a year ago or so, no matter how much they inject into the economy, there doesn't seem to be any growth. So instead of changing course, instead of saying, you know, maybe this strategy needs to be reworked, maybe we take another direction, they're doubling down. They're just, they seem to be, you know, the very definition of insanity. They're just doing more and more of it. And as a result, this is leading to real inflation that we really see in stuff. I see you've got some silver. This is the uh, Kaiser Ethical Silver Round. I see you have a gold... Uh, Krugeran, which I'll hold on to and uh, just for safekeeping. Uh, safety, safety. That's ex I explained that a year ago. That gold is safety. It's a yeah, safety. It's trade. safe now. It's never been safer. So, so what? What? Why did you bring these today? Well, I think that what's going on is asset bubbles are being inflated by the central banks around the world by starting a current Japan starting a currency war. I don't know how many people realize that, but when you inflate asset bubbles to create phantom collateral to support um, debt-based aggregate demand which is what the central banks are screaming about, Keynesian theory, let's create aggregate demand. What's going to happen is the debt-based aggregate demand that they're creating with phantom collateral, that's going to evaporate and implode when the stock markets ultimately collapse because they're not based upon reality. Okay, they're let, based let's... upon printing, and then the debt is going to remain. And what's going to happen, I mean, pensions are evaporating. The pensions, people are screaming in England because of what's happened with the pensions. And it's a good thing that the MPC has nine members who can vote against more monetary stimulus and against more unlimited money printing. I mean, bringing somebody in to print money is a dangerous game. All right, so two points there. You mentioned pension uh, holders in the UK are suffering. And the Bank of England put out a study. They said for every pound that is being saved on mortgages, let's say, with lower interest rates, they're losing two pounds in savings and pension accounts and in the insurance industry. So there, then, there again, you have the arithmetic of losing. Now, you also mentioned this idea of collateral, collateral value. So we know that in the global system of banking, it works on fractional reserve, where banks hold maybe 10% of the loans that they make. But over the past 10 years, Mitch, correct me if I'm wrong, the assimilation of these trillions and trillions of dollars of bad debt means that they're not really holding 10%, they're not really holding 1%. In the case of the Federal Reserve Bank, you know, they're, they're, what's the, the store money, the core money, the, the, the base money, the base money is uh, relative to the debts. They're less than 2% now, correct? Leverage in Europe has not changed. Leverage is getting bigger in the U.S. Too big to fail has gotten bigger. Now, there's a couple things we want to talk about here. Numbers never lie, but people, bankers, and politicians do. 
So you can manipulate numbers to say anything, and inflation is a good example of that. Oil prices, for example, I brought another prop along. Oh. If we take a look at this, oil prices since 2011, as you can see, are up 36%. Yet the official inflation numbers, as the government would like you to believe, they claim are benign, and Ben Bernanke says they're controlled. Similar to when he said in 2008 or 9 that subprime housing crisis was contained. What you also don't see in, in many places when people talk about buying equities and equities are undervalued. If equities were really and truly undervalued, you'd see a lot more merger and acquisition activity, which you're not really seeing. But gold in the past 10 years as you can see from this chart, is up over 500%, and the equities returns have been flat or, or, or minimal. Well, you know, this all sounds all very uh, fascinating, and we know the risks, we've covered the risks, and it, people say, well, one's going to explode. I think we already are seeing it exploding in something called the currency wars. So, I mean, Japan is, is one of the, the, the crucial players in this. Their currency against the euro and against the U.S. dollar and the pound if you look at it, it, there's been a gigantic move in the past six months. I think 26% the euro has moved against the yen. That's currency devaluation, currency debasement. It's a devaluation. And 16% against sterling and 16% against the U.S. dollar. Now, the euro, this is a 100 euro, 100, uh, euro note. note. If you notice, yeah, I can't even tell. It looks like play money. They've got a bunch of arcs on here and some bridges. Do you know where the bridge goes or where this bridge is? Um, that would be the Pont Neuf in Paris, uh, connect over the Seine. This is where I first met Stacey Herbert. Well, no, it's actually the bridge to nowhere because they couldn't agree upon what, what country's bridges to put on here, so they made it up. It's imaginary. Like, the value of this currency is appreciating on nothing, just on air. So it tells you what a bad state the economies must be in. You know, Spain is, is re re ready to implode. You can't believe anything that the leaders of Spain said. You know, there's a corruption charge going on there. And quite frankly, they have, they've ha had negative GDP, negative income from tax revenues, 26% unemployment, 60% youth unemployment, and people are buying those bonds. That's only the banks that have taken money from the um, LTRO are investing in those bonds. Those bonds are way overvalued in my view. Okay, it gets back to the plan of Ponzi because th this is a lottery ticket in plan of Ponzi. Correct. Basically, so it's a worthless piece of paper with worthless monuments that uh, has a little hologram in one corner that is backed up by the value of the European Central Bank. But the European Central Bank itself is imploding in terms of its, let's say, uh, base money to debt ratio is imploding. It's, it's, ex it's, exa it's expanding alarmingly at an alarmingly fast rate. They're, they, they're, they're not growing. There's no savings. It, it's become a hologram. Well, there's been no deleveraging in Europe yet. None of the banks have delevered, and that's a massive problem because you don't know what kind of toxic assets are on the books of the banks. I mean, look at MPS and the MPS scandal. All the emails disappeared. Are you shocked? I mean, Mario Draghi was the head of the Bank of Italy at the time, and all these emails have disappeared. There's an investigation going on. Right, mortgage back security. So well, they went down the memory happen? hole. Right, that's, that's exactly right, but, you know, that's Monty DePashi. Okay, we've got a minute or so left, and I just wanted to talk about a uh, key strategy here, the exit strategy, the unwinding strategy, because, okay, you've got all these banks, they've got all this incredible trillions of dollars of bad debt. They say, Bernanke said, well, we can start unwinding in 15 minutes, no problem. Um, that's what they say. But, of course, once they do start to unwind, and there's an actual bid for these things that they're trying to get rid of, then the rest of the market knows that the... It's not going to be supported by the central banks anymore, and they're going to sell. So they're going to be selling against everyone else selling at the same time. So you're going to have a huge crash. And they, and they therefore, a lot of people are saying that there is no exit strategy, that, that this will never end. They're, what we're heading for, Mitch, curious what you think about this, would be a, a global reset like we had at Bretton Woods after World War II. That won't work. I think that you'll have to have um, sovereign failures. And... What's happening? You're in Japan, you're thinking yeah, could be the could be the, the, one could be that, the first one, but and I, that I would think, be hyperinflation. Yeah, I think I don't know if it's going to be hyperinflation, but you're going to have these. If you debase the currency by thirty percent, that's exactly what you're going to get. There is no exit strategy. There are no buyers for the massive amounts of these so, bills. So, so the been, global Ponzi scheme, the music stops, and somebody doesn't have a chair, and that somebody you're thinking is Japan. Well, the first one might be Japan, but the United States has to get its way out of debt. They can't kick it down the road any further, which is what they're doing. That's a strategy that doesn't work. Hope is never a trading strategy, okay? Yeah. That doesn't work. I mean, you know how yeah, you, you can you remain hopeful longer right. than markets remain uh, irrational. That's exactly right. 
you know, LIBOR, the LIBOR scandal was the tip of the iceberg, as you know. There's a lot more out there. But lack of enforcement, as usual, is the problem. They have the tools to do it. They've chosen not to do it. Look at MF Global. What happened to that? I mean, 1.2 well, billion. Well, Mitch, you And John up. Corzine disappeared off into the sunset. He got whacked? No, I don't think so. Not yet? Not yet. So uh, what do you think about this idea that the banks are now saying that they're victims, that uh, they were... Uh, involved in these toxic CDOs because the rating agencies gave them high ratings. That's kind of a ridiculous argument, but you know, I think that that argument, S&P, they're going after S&P, and if, the, if one was guilty, they're all guilty. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that the banks could have been unwound like that savings and loans in America. And right. The, the Resolution Trust Corporation, that was the depository for all the bad stuff during the savings and loan crisis in America, that is what now people call a bad bank, correct? Correct. Well, That's what I they mean, call it, is, it now, the it bad is, bank. It is a bad bank. Right. So they took all the junk, they put it into a bad bank. They essentially um, presented the deposits. They got new management, and they brought about competition. Got rid of the bad guys, brought about competition. Then they tried to work out of the bad debt over 20, 30 years. As the market hopefully improves, you kind of leak it out, leach it out, and you can get rid of it over time. But the idea of creating a bad bank now in a $600 trillion global derivatives market and it is like you need a bad planet. I think this you need a Ponzi planet needs a bad ba planet Ponzi. But I think that your 600 trillion in derivatives is an understatement. If you look at the um, controller of the currency's website, it's exponential the amount that they're admitting to on balance sheet. So you know that it's probably much larger. It's a much larger number. As always, when they report losses like the whale went from two to six to whatever. Right. It's bigger than 600 trillion. I'm telling. We you. need a bad planet. That's exactly right. To, to, to store, like sequester the bad Planet debt. Planet Ponzi is the way out. Planet X. Yeah. Wait, it's the way out? Yeah, We're going to monetize out. Planet Ponzi? This is going to be the new collateral holding the Planet global Ponzi. central bank? It could. You could float a $1 trillion new uh, credit default swaps but just using this as collateral. Because all the CDOs, CLOs, and C all these products have come back, and leverage has gotten bigger. There were no lessons learned by Too Big to Fail. The regulators have lost even more to teeth. There is no guard dog. The guard dog has no teeth, but a, a reasonable bark on television. That's all the time we have. It goes by so fast. We'll have to have you on again soon, but thanks for being on the Kaiser Report. Max, I appreciate it. It was great. Thanks for having me. All right. And that's going to do it for this edition of the Kaiser Report with me, Max Kaiser, and Stacey Herbert. I want to thank my guest, Mitch Firestein, author of this classic, instant classic, Planet of Ponzi. If you'd like to contact us, please tweet us at Kaiser Report or at facebook.com forward slash Kaiser Report. Until next time, Max Kaiser saying bye, y'all.